Hello and welcome. The Lord has told us what is good and right. The Lord requires of us that we are to do justice. The Lord our God calls us to love kindness. We are to walk humbly with our God. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. O God, our guide and guardian, you have led us away from the stress and the strain of the world to be in your peaceful presence. Grant us grace to worship you in spirit and in truth. May we find comfort in your love and may you build us up by your faith. Enable us to do the work that you have called us to without fear of failure or hesitation to do good. May we worship you not just with our lips this hour, but in word and deed all the days of our lives. Amen. Today's reflection is from the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with the oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. We read the words of Psalm 23 and hear words of comfort. That God will take care of us when we follow him. That no matter what we face, we need not fear what we face with the Lord. We hear of how God's mercy will always be with us and that we will always be with God. What is something that gives you comfort in the Lord? What is a way that you share that comfort with others? Does God give you assurance in all that you do? Do you strive to help others feel that same assurance? What do the words of the 23rd Psalm mean to you personally? How do we celebrate God together? If you'd pray with me. Oh God, you are our hope and you are our praise. Help us to seek your wisdom in all that we are and all that we do. May we be strengthened by your steadfast love and faithfulness as we come before you in prayer this day. Help us, Lord, that you lift us up in both our joys and our sorrows. Be with us in both our laughter and our tears. May your light guide us and lead us to life everlasting through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our scripture readings for today come from the New Revised Standard Version Bible, and our first reading is from Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall be put to death. We continue with Galatians chapter 2, verses 15 through 21. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but through the faith of Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by doing the works of the law. Because no one will be justified by the works of the law. But if in our effort to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. But if I build up again the very things that I once tore down, then I demonstrate that I am a transgressor. For through the law I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. 
Our final reading for today comes from the Gospel according to John, chapter 8, verses 2 through 11. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They said this to test him, so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today's message gives us another look at the way Christ changes our understanding of the Old Testament law through interpretation. This one is actually a pretty major shift. And the reason I say that is that in many ways it is a complete departure from the law. Some might object to that statement, saying that it somehow would infer that the letter of the law is being changed. With that, I would say no. It's being changed through interpretation. And the reason that matters is that we can get into a sort of pedantic argument about whether or not the law has been changed. And it can cause us to miss seeing exactly what's going on here. And so I highlight this difference because it helps us to sidestep those frivolous discussions because the letter of the law isn't being changed as much as it is the interpretation of how the law should be enacted and lived out. We began with a rather short section of Leviticus 20. The section is short because I simply wanted to highlight the specific law in question. The law that comes up in our gospel reading. When two people commit adultery, they both shall be put to death. Pretty straightforward. Now, in Galatians, we get an interpretation of the law through Christ. Paul tells us that righteousness doesn't come through the law. Paul instead focuses on the grace of God. Part of what Paul is saying here is that the law is not what will justify someone. The law will not bring salvation. But Paul repeats an oft-heard idea for us. That if we have died in Christ, we are risen in Christ, and it is no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. Paul shifts emphasis away from the law onto grace, mercy, and Christ. Now, it's a great lead-in into our gospel reading today. And it is the center of what we are looking at. In the gospel according to John, we have what would have been a rather awkward situation for everyone involved. Jesus is sitting down to teach, and then the scribes and the Pharisees bring a woman caught in adultery. Now, I know I have mentioned this at some time before, and I will forever note the oddity of this situation. Because bringing one person caught in adultery is a supremely odd thing since it's something that takes two people. And as we read before, in Leviticus, both are guilty. And so we already get the suspicion that this is some sort of elaborate setup from the get-go. 
because it starts with a situation that is odd in and of itself, that doesn't feel right at all. But they come before Jesus with what's supposed to be a trap. The Pharisees and scribes say that the woman was caught in adultery and that the law of Moses says they should stone her to death. They want to know what Jesus says to this. Now here they want to catch him, either violating the law of Moses or the laws of Rome. Either one will suffice. They just want to catch him somehow. If he's going to have grace and mercy and show love, he's going to have to reject the law of Moses. But if he doesn't reject the law of Moses, he's going to have to reject both mercy and Roman law, which prevents them from carrying out the execution. It is meant to be an easy win. So they push and push, and eventually Jesus responds to them. He says that if you have no sins, go ahead and throw the first stone. He then goes back to riding on the ground, patiently waiting. And everyone leaves. Everyone wanders away except for the woman they brought before Christ. And Jesus says that if nobody else has condemned her, then he won't condemn her either. Now, I wanted to look at this when we look at interpretation, because this brings up a rather interesting part of interpreting the law. The letter of the law still exists, but enforcing it is now a very different matter. Jesus interprets in a way that changes the focus and does make it impossible to enforce the condemnation by stoning. We see mercy and grace in action with this interpretation. That if somebody is going to take a life, let them be someone without sin. And that's pretty hefty. Because who? Who is going to be able to carry out this judgment? I know I'm not. Nobody facing the woman they brought before Jesus is willing. There's an idea here that we must first be willing to condemn ourselves before we condemn, condemn anyone else. If we can hold ourselves up as blameless, then we may begin to condemn others. But if anything causes us to condemn ourselves, then we must condemn ourselves and pass judgment on ourselves first. Now, one might interpret that as saying that we should pass judgment on ourselves and punish ourselves before anyone else. And that would also miss the larger point being made. And that is that when Jesus finishes this, he asks if anyone could condemn her. And she says, no, Christ looks at her and says, he won't either. If there is no one left to pass judgment, then he will not condemn if they cannot. Mercy and grace. That is the core of everything in this interpretation. When I read this, I see Jesus showing that mercy and grace and that they are at the core of God's love. That God's love isn't about judgment and condemnation and punishment. That if we are to condemn each other, we are truly condemning ourselves first. And that Christ is there to say that he's not condemning us, because he's here to save us. He's not here to punish, but to set us free from the chains of bondage that hold us through sin and death. And that we shouldn't hang ourselves on the law as much as we should live a life of love. Now, one of the mistakes that we can make with this is by limiting it. What do I mean by that? It's easy to read this and hold it in light of one thing. We could say that Jesus gives this response about adultery, so that must be the only thing that it covers. Because of that, we should leave everything else out. The reality is that Jesus is holding up the law as a whole and asking us how we are actually going to live up to the law, to any law. If you too are transgressors, how do you plan on upholding the law? 
If you too have violated the law, how does it make you righteous enough to condemn others? How does one find justice and hypocrisy? How does it serve anyone if the law is used selectively? The law becomes a tool for keeping others down instead of a way to find justice, and when used that way, shows the utmost hypocrisy and lack of grace and mercy. And if we are hypocrites, we are not fully living up to the ideal of God's love. And that's the biggest takeaway for me. We have a choice to make in our lives. Whether we will live by law and judgment or whether we will live by grace and mercy. Whether we will feel that we are called to condemn others in place of God or whether we are called to love others on behalf of God. The choice that we make is if we cling to the law or if we cling to Christ. Do we live and die by the law or are we living in Christ because we have died in Christ and are risen in Christ? Because for the life of me, I can't figure out how to make those things go together. If I have to choose, I will choose living in Christ. I will choose the path of love. I will choose to try my best to be merciful. I will try to be full of grace. Because rather they condemn by the law, I would rather be completed by the love of Christ. And I pray that we may all find peace and comfort knowing that our God is a God who desires mercy and not sacrifice. A God who requires love and not condemnation. That we may know God's steadfast love that endures forever through life in our risen Savior. With mercy and grace abound. Amen. Let us pray. God, you are with us even when we turn away from you. Guide us back into your loving arms. Judge us not by the perfection of our actions, but show us mercy and love. We have strayed like lost sheep from your ways, failing both in what we have done and what we have failed to do. Bring us back into your fold that you may guide us and lead us in all things. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us and forgive us. May we walk in your love and trust your ways. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. May the Lord forgive all your sins and lift you up in love through Jesus Christ our Lord and by the Holy Spirit keep you in life eternal. Amen. If you are so moved to make an offering, you may send it to the church treasurer or you may send it to the P.O. Box. We are still the church, and the church still needs your support to keep doing all the important work that we do. Now as God's children reconciled and forgiven, let us pray the way that our Savior taught us to pray, as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now may we go forth, showing grace and mercy to all, because of the love that we find through the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Until we meet again, amen.